Talk about uh, what we have going on in the primary. All the numbers have been released. Yeah, uh, well, Warren <clears> today. <throat> and I, was, I was wondering for a while why Warren didn't release her number, and I thought it's either bad, not like terrible bad, but middling, or it's really good and she wants the day to herself. Yeah. And it turned out uh, uh, it was it was interesting. It, it, it was right a hair beneath Bernie. Uh, good numbers, like for anyone, but still... <laughs> worse numbers than Bernie and Bernie came right out the gate with his numbers which was a gamble on his team's part because presumably they did not know no, for what? sure what Warren's numbers were and if Warren said uh oh that's cute 25 million I, I got 40 million they would have looked like assholes yep but instead this is probably just a good outcome what's ironic here is uh Warren's average donation well, 26 27 dollars 27 dollars was famously the Bernie right. average donation uh this time around Bernie's average is 18. Um, and he has, I think, about 1.3 million donors. One, he has 1 million donors. Uh, 1.3 million was the number of donations oh, in that okay, quarter. Okay. Because usually people will chip in 10, 20 bucks every time they see something that pisses them right. off on the internet. So 1 million donors and about 99% of them have not maxed out. So yeah, that means yeah. that there's a lot of uh, growth there. I don't, I haven't seen, um, the, the comparable set of numbers for Warren, I think she had something like now has close to 700,000 donors uh, and coming in with 24 point something million and Bernie had 25 point. Yes. I'm curious what the overlap is as well. That would be interesting. I'm not uh, sure if there's any way to collate that. Actually, there might be because all of that. It would the, be not. All public data. I'm sure they. Well, it is all public data. In fact, I think they they. Um, they track those. I know I've the, talked. The to, problem is some of the data is corrupted. You know, because people just like they enter in their information in weird ways. Right. And as well, I don't think, for instance, if I donate to Bernie, if I'm assigned an FEC tracking number, so all of my donations have that tracking number, I guess is what I'm saying. So you would have to look up my name. Uh, so if if like John's there's going to be, you know, thousands of John Smith's donating. So. I would like to know who these people are who maxed out on their Bernie donations. I feel like it's literally just the members of Vampire Weekend and maybe some of you guys at uh, Chapo. One of my colleagues did. Yeah. I won't tell you who, but one of my colleagues did. Nice. I also ben you want to maintain your... Uh, I, it was not of... me. It was not me. I'll tell you that. Uh, you'll have to do some uh, shoe leather reporting if you want to get to the bottom of who. I know two people who I think maxed out. Um, Early. Early. Yeah. early yeah all right well good job so, class traders and, and and we should say biden uh did, tanked biden did 15 million and which is fine if you're not joe biden right i mean if you're pete Buttigieg, yeah it's what really did we make good. of before we what have we making Buttigieg is 19 that's that's pretty good uh that was still lower than his last quarter yeah mm -hmm. he's in it I mean, I think he has, um, he has he is resilient, doing though. the donors and I don't know. I, I mean, I think it's, he's a guy who's going to, I don't know what he does. Is it an this. investment in the future? You run incredible race. You go to, you get a talk show on MSNBC or something. Then you run national you could in a be different vice president. state. You could run as vice president. If he doesn't get picked as vice president, my guess would be he has to run national in a different state. Because that's like why we're even doing this whole exercise. National I mean, in a different state. Well, I'm saying he can't run for Senate or even Congress in Indiana, presumably. Probably I mean, not. Maybe if we're in the a future. different guy. I mean, there's could. a reason why the th the mayor of like what is it, the third or fourth largest city in the state, is running for president. It's kind of the whole exercise is kind of ridiculous, but he couldn't. I, I don't think he would have had a viable Senate run, and if he did, he would have lost. And then he would be done. Yeah, I have I have no idea what his uh, future plans are. Uh, but so, all right, let me ask you this, because yesterday I had on uh, Eric Levitz to talk about his piece. I don't know if you mm -hmm. read that in the. Uh, I did not. And, and the argument that he makes is that, at least in the context of uh, domestic politics, because I think he um, he concedes that uh, Bernie has a, a better foreign policy and in, in, in the context of of where American politics will probably be for the next president, assuming it's either Bernie or Warren, that that makes a difference. Um, and that that is, I think he says, you know, that is a, a, a valid sort of uh, a place to differentiate uh, between the two candidates. But his argument is, and I uh, summed it up, for, I gave him this analogy and, 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 and he accepted it as a, as a basically broad statement on his piece, was that 
Uh, Bernie may be going 70 miles, uh, may be a vehicle that can go 70 miles an hour. And uh, Warren is one that can go, let's say, uh, 60 miles an hour. Uh, and Biden is one that can go 30 miles an hour, but it's a 50 mile an hour speed limit. Uh, the constraints of American politics are going to be such on any president that their ability, despite the fact that Bernie's uh, plans may be more ambitious uh, and um, and uh, more universal, that their ability to implement these yeah. Yeah. are going to be constrained uh, on either one of them. What uh, what do you make of that argument and that that the the distinctions that people are trying to make between Warren and uh, Bernie are therefore uh, at least in domestic politics a little bit overblown? If the constraints are the problem, then remove the constraints. Uh, the f- fact that we have a a react these reactionary institutions that would presumably prevent even the most modest redistribution of wealth or modest threats to private profit or private property in this country, that's just a reason to give up. And that's that 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 shows how much we suffer from a a lack of imagination that there can be an any economic system that is at all different from the one that we have. Well and in, in, in practical terms, that can mean things like statehood for dc that can mean things like packing the supreme court which things you could do with a bare majority that also means realigning things that means going to places like west virginia or kansas that used to be well in west virginia's case used to be reliable democratic votes and that means realigning the democratic party itself so that it is not the party that just represents coastal and college town intellectuals. Well, also think about their ability to deal with these constraints. They are not the same. They don't have the same strategy. They don't have the same approach. I think Elizabeth Warren's approach is more one of technocracy and plans. And Bernie's approach is one of building a movement that lasts past the election, which is something I think he understands better than anyone else running by far. It's something Obama didn't really understand. Like read some of Megan Day's pieces in Jacobin, I think on like exactly the kind of labor movement and the kind of grassroots power that would be necessary for Bernie to pass anything that he's trying to do that just doesn't exist with anyone else. Right. And, but, uh, and, and, and Levitz addressed this by saying that, that, um, that, that theory, the, the idea that um, under Sanders, you will realign the Democratic Party in such a way uh, that will be that will cross the sort of the partisan lines that we have now on some level. Um, it has been not borne out by results in 2018 that the the issue sets and whatnot have not gone there. His argument is uh, that he starts it with is that the left at this point is not as um, strong as it would appear. All superstructure, no base. Yes, all superstructure, no base. In 2018, it was still Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer's party. It's still the party of big D.C. donors. Like The party hadn't changed just because lefties won a handful of primaries. Right. And I think his argument is that that the party won't be uh, materially different in 2020 either. I think if Bernie Sanders were the nominee, it would be the beginning of that process. And I'm not sure how rapid that process could take. But something that heartens me is seeing these videos of billionaires, like the uh, billionaire founder of Home Depot. I forget his name. Yes. Ken, how Ken Langone. Ken Langone's name. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And his going on TV and saying, you know, I, 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 uh, Bernie Sanders against me. I think we should get rid of Bernie Sanders. Right. Uh, so that's the, the uh, Blackstone guy. That's the Blackstone one. guy. Those okay. Well, they both said that actually. Oh, Lingone said get rid of it too. Wow. Yeah. They uh-huh. keep they Damn. keep they keep coming out against the guy, and it's very obvious that his message, which is specifically labor oriented, is a threat to them. I had the opportunity last week to interview Bernie Sanders. And uh, I don't know if you had a chance to watch that interview. No, I heard it just got released. Yeah, it just got dropped uh, this morning. And, uh, you know, we we had a a far-reaching discussion. Uh, He had uh, seen the Joker already. All the senators get a (laughs) uh, uh, screener for it. And, yeah, he's pro. He wants all the supporters to watch it and take their inspiration from that film. Uh, He will will reverse the jewel ban. Uh, Hell, yeah. 
and yeah, he's and you know he's he's gonna make. Nah, sorry, I had a third thing for you. Well, okay, I, but but I guess I, I no, I mean I. Oh okay, anyway, anyway, I'm sorry, sorry. So uh, essentially, what I asked him was along these lines, and but with the context of you say you know you want to be the organizer in chief. Right. You know what does what does this actually mean? Like wh what does bottom up political change look like? What what does labor militancy? look like how does that actually affect change how does that relate to the institutions that a president or a member of congress must navigate and how does your you and your how do you and your campaign uh, uh intersect with that and in the in the days leading up to that interview he had been in chicago where the chicago teachers union uh voted they had a rally uh john cusack was there for some reason and they voted uh, by like 99% to approve a strike. Right. Uh, and he gave this, you know, this this firebrand speech there where he called out Lori Lightfoot, the Democrat mayor of Chicago, by name. And he told them that you are fighting a class war. Then he flew to Michigan and he spoke at a UAW picket. They're, they're uh, entering now the third week of their strike uh, against GM. And he said, told them much the same thing. The labor movement, what remains of the labor movement, loves Bernie because they share his conception of power and change. Right. And when, when, when he talks about labor militancy, that means a labor movement that is not just trying to defend what they have that's not on the back foot it's as they've been for decades. It's not fortress unionism. It but, is, it yeah, is trying to, exactly. and, and, yeah. they're, and they're trying to, to, you know, they're expanding, I think, And it goes beyond just what they're getting. Right, but, but social it is, justice it is, unionism. Uh, yes. Right, that that the teachers, the Chicago teachers strike was, 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 was sort of the modern paradigm shifter for that, the, the first one yeah. uh, eight years ago. Right, followed um, by the Jether strikes in the rest of the country. Um, the... But the 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 point remains. I mean, I think all that's true, and I think that I think that uh, Levitz would um, would concede that. Uh, but I think the question is is where are we on that point? Like, will <clears throat> will we know if the left has that strength? If this strategy is working? I mean, we'll, it seems to me that we'll know if he wins Iowa, despite the fact that the polling shows that he won't. Yeah. Now, we'll know that. I mean, if he can't win those early states is that indicative of the fact that the left is still not where it needs to be for that for, for that attempt to be a factor in creating legislation and policies in these changes in the year 2021 we, and 2022 well, answer, 2023 to answer your question we know the left isn't where it needs to be because by and large the anti-capitalist left is still mostly intellectuals college students and the like and the idea is that like that that very small strata downwardly mobile millennials from the middle class right and who do who many of whom do actually have b serious material concerns that we're not yeah we're not not the working class we're just a small slice of the working class and we need to be the entire working class in order to win i'm more of the leisure class but i see what you're saying <laughs> uh the idea is that this small strata links up and radicalizes the the much bigger working class base and that hasn't happened yet but it's not it's not a, 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 a process that, you know, lightning strikes and, 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 and like everything blows up. But I think there are times when nothing happens. And I think there's times when a lot of things happen. And as well, what the Bernie Sanders like campaign is, that is the vehicle to do that, to bring that project into fruition, is to radicalize people because he is a weird man. He is a, 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 a weird old man who talks in a thick Brooklyn accent. Great from, dynamic case here, Virgil. From Vermont. <laughs> but people listen to him. That's people right. perceive him as being on their side because his entire life he has spoken about people's material concerns. He so, doesn't get wrapped up in, you know, the flavor of the day. Uh, can we, can I, I agree with everything you're saying. I think there's just a, there's a couple of different things that I've gleaned from looking over the Levitt piece. So one is I think that some of the some of it is that the left is is weak. 
And that's true. I don't think any, even including the people he's critiquing and Jacobin deny that. Everybody accepts that the left needs to be. Then is the theory of change compelling? Then how big an actual material difference is there in terms of what kind of policy set can get implemented, right? Like these are kind of the different lanes he's dealing with. Right. And I think that, I mean, and I, I won't replicate what Virgil said. I, I, I'm still compelled by the movement argument and the stink value proposition of what Sanders is doing, just even in the sense that I think that what he's doing is generating, you know, you will talk to people who say, oh, in 2016, I volunteered for his campaign. Now I'm a labor organizer. You know, you still get mm. that unparalleled kind of outgrowth of that. Oh, but yeah, then I, I also think, and, all the time and I think that, through that, yeah, exactly. I think though that there's another kind of interesting tension in the piece, and honestly, maybe I, I should reread it, but I'm a little confused on because on one hand, he's uh, look, I, I think that it's fine to note that Warren is kind of playing a dual strategy where she's running a center left reform campaign and then also reaching out to Hillary Clinton, and I don't, I think that that's just true, right? Like it doesn't need to be like. See, she's a secret sellout. We hate her. But I think it's also, yeah, there's a different approach here, and that's fine. Well, he addresses that. And he addresses it. But I think it's interesting. Bernie's doing the same thing. Bernie, well, right. And I think hinging strategy. your argument on that is a mistake because, of course, they're doing the same thing in terms of reaching out to superdelegates and so on. Although I, I think the maybe the soliciting of Clinton's opinion is a bit different than having a, a superdelegate strategy. But he goes on to say that. And this is actually where I, I'm not sure I would read this the same way, because he says that maybe, maybe that in, in light of these facts, it's not conceivable that a president more closely aligned with the Democratic Party and less openly hostile to its key power centers would actually be able to get senators like John Tester and Kristen Sinema to swallow marginally more progressive legislation in 2021 than a president with an independent uh, public uh, political identity who projected contempt for their wing of the party. And you know, I see what he's saying, but I actually think that there, there, that actually loops back to the advantage that Bernie has in a general election with his independent brand. Because when you look at people like Tester and Cinema, they're infinitely to the right of Bernie, but they also get a lot of mileage themselves out of projecting contempt on Democratic power centers. Mm -hmm. And I think that that might actually end up working like you say all the time, Sam, in terms of people's less policy, more dispositional focus. I, I mean, I that's think, a looping advantage, in my opinion. I think. I think. I. I mean, I. He. Levis is not really making an argument about electability in the general election, and I think that. Well, is he was a, making about getting legislation passed. He's talking about legislation. Yeah, and I actually think that that could work. I think a guy that could go to a place like Montana more plausibly, and say, "Hey, John, you and I both kind of." you know, roll our eyes at Chuck Schumer, or however the hell you put it, work with me to push this anti-DC agenda is a much more compelling way of pressuring somebody like John Tester than John Tester going like, hey, you know, Montana folks, I'm not voting for this big ag breakup bill because he's insufficiently deferential to national Democrats that you hate. Well, I don't think it's a, I, I, don't, I don't think that was what, what Levitz, I mean, I think Levitz would, would concede that it could go either way. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think that's the thing he's 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 arguing is that it is you can make a rational argument on either way that uh, someone who plays an inside game has the ability uh, and doesn't come with the baggage of being anti-capitalist uh, in a, uh, you know, in a, in a redder state um, that may, you know, or with corporate Democrats even uh, may may have an easier time, but I think he would also concede it's also possible that Bernie may speak to people there and create more pressure for like a Joe Manchin, let's say. Um, oh, I, mean, yeah. I, I mean, I think that's the, that, I mean, I think that's well, basically- even like when he says centrist Democrats, this is what some part of our job that's just legitimately hard, right? Because like, you know, Chris Coons, yes, probably more likely that he can sit down and have a drink with Elizabeth Warren and be persuaded on some- derivative regulation if it doesn't contradict his donor base too much. But I think a, centr a centrist Democrat that represents a place like West Virginia or Montana, it's almost entirely predicated on somebody being able to go to that a state like that with credibility and say, We're, I'm against the establishment 
time to you know put your money where your mouth is oh, yeah. basically like, here, here's the thing about red states and they talk about this a lot on Trill Billy Workers Party which is one of my favorite podcasts right now they're in Kentucky um, red states like Kentucky the conventional wisdom is oh you need to run a moderate because it's a mixture of Democrats and Republicans but like no red states have some of the highest rates of poverty and the lowest rates of voting and those two things are connected so if you have somebody who's speaking to people's material interests, who's standing up against the Democratic Party establishment, which has screwed them over and over again when they've been in power, um, that's going to make more of a case to people who've dropped out and who are disenfranchised. I don't know if it's going to work or not. There are a lot you, of factors working against it. I, 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 I am somewhat moved by the idea that you're going to do better if you offer material benefit to people. But I mean, Elizabeth Warren is, you know, I, there's a difference between her policy set and and Bernie Sanders, but yep. it is and, and far to the left and and naming em enemies. I mean, she she uh, I think she talks about does, Wall Street. And yeah, a very quite a bit. Enemy fan. So. Um, I mean, I Did think they that, talk like, about Wall Street from different uh, dialects. You know. I mean, I think that's true. I think that's oh, true. I, but I, I just don't think there are people true. in Kentucky who are saying. We vote for Republicans because when Democrats are in power, they are screwing us over. No, no, no. People don't vote because Democrats are screwing them over and they don't think either party is going to do anything for them. And they're usually right. Do you think, though, and this it's is... It's about a, turnout, not persuasion. This is... Right. Right. Always this is, this is I, 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 just, I think Kentucky, it's not going to happen. Do you think, though, and this is a decades-long argument, do you think, though, if, if Democrats have been delivering over the past three decades... That you would that, it at the very least would present a real conflict for somebody. If, as an example, their social inclinations contradicted their economic ones, if they could say there is one national party that I disagree with because on immigration or whatever, but they actually really are delivering for me in terms of killing something like NAFTA, I think we would have a very different national politics if that was the case over the last several I, decades. I, I, think, I, I think even more to the point, if the Democrats had done more to support uh, unions, they'd have an apparatus that there would get go. people out. And, it, and sure. I don't know that the individual go. voter would be making some type of calculation like that. Yeah, of course. That's the um, thing. Uh, but that's what we need to regenerate. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I guess the, the point is, is it, it, it gets back to the point of like, when I look at Warren's, um, uh, you know, and I... I I think that if there's a 20% chance or a 10% chance that Bernie's going to be able to actually do that realignment, then it's worth it uh, in my mind. But the, the distinction between uh, Warren's labor plan, which calls for not all, but many of the same things that Bernie uh, does, the, the, I don't think that I think both of them are going to receive a similar reception in the context of of being able to legislate for it. Now, I think that I if I could jump in here. Yes. I I don't need to know the details. I don't care about the plans and non-voters don't need to know the details and they don't care either. They you vote for a representative because you want someone to figure out the details. Someone right. else has to right. figure that out. Uh, you know, it's uh, you're like you're not getting screwed because someone in the bureaucracy didn't carry the two. That's not the problem here. Mm -hmm. They they and I want to know, are you on my side? Do you represent my interests? And if you erase class distinctions, as we've done in the past 40 years, pretend that they don't exist, then everyone's going to have a really muddled idea of what that means being on my side. And chances are you're just going to resort to cultural signifiers. I think that the Bernie campaign is the only one that has a chance of breaking through that. It's, it's, not, it's, it's a process that I think would be slow, but I think that it's already from his first campaign through today already bearing fruit i think it's it's already generating that kind of change it's it's certainly realigned the way democrats talk about things that guys like pete Buttigieg pander to voters for yep. instance and ultimately i think that if the elizabeth warren campaign radicalizes you it's they radicalize you to vote for elizabeth warren if the bernie sanders campaign radicalizes you it's to join a labor your union or or make your labor union more militant absolutely yeah or get involved in your local dsa chapter like i know people in dsa who are 
I would say on the left pole of DSA right now, they've gone to political ed. They're like, oh, yeah, Bernie's not even a socialist. I know now that he's a social Democrat and I'm a communist. They came in because of Bernie Sanders in 2016. And that's an amazing fact to me. I think like right now, there's obviously I mean, there's one tendency which is ridiculous on the on some of the sort of Warren adjacent to really try to erase the vital differences. And then I think there's a countervailing tendency uh, in, in some of the sort of not certainly not in his campaign, but in the Sanders world to sort of exaggerate, uh, you know, Warren's negatives. And these things are kind of obvious. They're expected during a campaign. But I don't I, neither of those moves are necessary to really clearly de delineate some very large differences here. Um, and, and, I, and I think the, the approach does matter a lot because there's long term implications to it as well. I, I actually think Obama, I mean, Obama's even more problematic because I, I don't well, Obama did build a movement. We say it all the time. He built a movement that was literally personality centric and then dissembled it. And, you know, that's that is I mean, that's neither Warren nor what Sanders is doing. Right. Yeah. I mean, that is uh, just um, uh, building up this beautiful car and then saying, like, oh, I'm on the inside now. I don't want it to compete with me. I mean, literally. And, yes. We just we just built the world's fastest. Uh, it's an electric Lamborghini. All right. Then, All right let's put well, that's good. I uh, uh, I advertised uh, yesterday that we would have the a, a mirror conver a mirror image conversation of the one we had yesterday with Eric Levitz. I, I mean, I think uh, pretty much. Um, I mean, I think like the um, the, you know, the. The. The, the I think the argument is, is that really, in my mind, that um, you can lose better one way than another way. And that um, that losing these legislative fights with Bernie Sanders, as opposed to losing them with Elizabeth Warren, is actually beneficial long term politics uh, in this country, because uh, how you lose. I mean, it's on some level, it's similar to my impeachment argument. They're not going to get him out of office. Yeah, they are. Uh, all, what the Democrats are doing is they're signifying we're going to hold him to account. And to the extent that we can hold him to account, it's stopped by Republicans here. And it has implications for politics. Not because you're not going to be facing Donald Trump, but you're going to be facing you're going to be able to do a lot more structural difference in terms of Republicans across the board. And I think there's a similar dynamic with Bernie Sanders going out there having the same exact fight that Elizabeth Warren is having, that the way that they fight and lose will be different and will have more uh, value, uh, broadly speaking, to progressive politics in the future. I only, you know, had the chance to talk to Bernie for about 20 minutes. They let me go a little long. And I wish... Well, they it, usually give me about 21. I... <laughs> that's not a big deal. Well, they did give me... They did let me go long, so ultimately I got about 30 well, that's fine. I mean, I do my pre-interview too. <laughs> right, you had the uh, you have the ex exclusive, uh, you know, for the high donor lounge. With the Bernie high donor before. lounge, exactly. Bernie was like, VIP. "Oh, you're gonna have Levitz on the concern troll? Screw you, Sam. Seven minutes." <laughs> uh, but I wish I had more time because I I would love to hear Bernie articulate this point uh, further. And uh, my producer Chris. Uh, we were talking about the interview afterwards, and he said, you know, the one thing that I want answered is, okay, let's say it's it's February 2021, and, you know, you have the, the, the Medicare for All bill, you know, ban private health insurance, the nationalized health insurance on the floor, and... Uh, you know, it's 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 not getting out of committee. You know, you have a movement. You have an email list of of tens of millions at this point. Uh, what what what's your first email? Right. What, is, what does that say, uh, Senator? Tell me where to throw a brick. Right. Interesting. What, did you ask him about uh, about the because we you talked about structural reform in terms yeah. of like uh, those? Did you ask him about the filibuster? No, 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 no detail stuff. No. Um, and, and court packing. I mean, he is at least projecting sort of a uh, an institutionalist perspective on these things. I mean, yeah. you know, there's some argument as to whether reconciliation. I mean, this is, these are important things in terms of like legislative strategy, right? I mean, aren't Isn't they? Isn't it an interesting dialectic, though? I mean, like if you, th I'm thinking back to the conversation with Shahid Buttar, who, by the way, we should, we, I should have pulled it up. He had an amazing fundraising cycle. Uh, raising fundraising quarter in his challenge for Pelosi. Oh, good. Um, 
And his sort of articulation of being a fusion of a democratic socialist with like very strong constitutional uh, commitment to constitutional protections. I, at the very least, think it's interesting that Bernie's projecting that, like, on one hand, I'm going to be the organizer in chief. I'm going to have a completely unparalleled relationship to trying to essentially mobilize millions of people to be engaged in forcing Congress's hand. And we'll see. We don't know whether that will succeed or not. I think that's the only remote path in terms of anything that could possibly work. And then on the other hand, I'm actually going to sort of mash that up with some institutional respect, which I think presumably he must have just, he must be speaking from the perspective of somebody who sees that he was able to thwart some damage at the margins using this type of thing. That could be like my sort of my only guess, but I think it's an interesting argument. I, I will say this, uh, you remember the ACA fight in 2017. In 2017. Yes. Yeah. Yes. The repeal fight. Yeah. Yes. And uh, the scenes of disability activists holding die-ins yep. at the yep. uh, at the U.S. Capitol Huge. and being arrested, you know, hold out of uh, uh, committee meetings and things like that. Uh, I think that for Sanders to push his agenda, I think it would look a lot like that, where that activist fight is not. It's not on the back foot it's not in the way that that union movements have been the, the for what, what do you call it fortress unionism uh i think it, it would not be fortress activism where this only comes out when what little we have is now under fire and we should say i mean and not coincidentally bernie was immediately crisscrossing the country holding rallies to protect the aca at that time yeah. uh 2017 yeah he actually did it that was a great example of him doing that work. All right. Well